What's up, everybody? Raj Chander here, uh, Canavision Southeast Regional Production Lead, along with uh, my main man, Chris Jackson. We are together co-hosts of the Canavision Policy Report, and we are about to bring you uh, episode two. Chris, say what's up to everybody. What's happening, everybody? Happy to be back. There's a lot that's been going on, a lot of conversations for us to have. Um, and so here in Michigan, uh, trying not to be cold. You know what I mean? <laughs> this time of year. Um it's cold out here too, man. It's yeah, freezing. Okay, 21 enough. degrees. 21 oh, okay, degrees. Fair. <laughs> but but cannabis is heating up. So I'm excited to have this conversation today, man. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm excited too. Uh so today we are gonna be focusing on uh Chris's home state of Michigan. Uh I was going over some documents and stuff last week and uh saw that well i had seen the news story but then i actually kind of dove into it and i found it pretty interesting um the uh, michigan uh racial equity advancement work group did i get that right i think that's the the acronym so oh, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah exactly so they released a uh, new guidance uh they're they're a body under the mra which is the michigan regulatory association that uh, governs cannabis in the state. So they released uh, new guidelines on, I believe it was January 19th. And there's a series of uh, points and, and recommendations that we're going to dive into a little bit throughout the course of this episode. Um, but to start off, Chris, I wanted to talk to you just broadly speaking about uh, the context of this. And before we started recording, like you and I were chatting about how they realized there was going to be a broader need to push for diversity in the industry and, you know, inclusion. Um, so, you know, kind of set the stage for us, like tell us a little bit about how both the committee and the work group came about and then also this specific uh, meeting. Yeah, no problem, man. So, so the first thing is, is obviously racial diversity in the cannabis industry is a nationwide issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, to the tune of only 4%, maybe 5%, depending on which data you're looking at. Um, in this case, though, in Michigan, uh, it's right around, or maybe even a little bit less than the national average. You know, in, in conversations with Director Brisbo, who is ultimately over the Marijuana Regulatory Agency here in Michigan, um, part of that conversation, and he expressed it openly, even in a keynote conversation that we had uh, for the NCIA at the last cyber um, event. Um, the keynote conversation, in that conversation, he, he came out and he said, look, what we were hoping to have had to accomplish uh, when it comes to social equity, per the program that we put together, um, particularly when it comes to, you know, the people that should have access to it, um, you know, minorities, black and brown, uh, of folks, as well as women even, right, um, hasn't necessarily been the case. He actively wanted to do something to change that notion. The thing that I appreciate most about both the Michigan market and the California market is that there seems to be this sense of we'll try it. And if we need to adjust it so far as social equity is concerned, we're willing to do it. That's not always the case, right, in other states. Um, so I yeah. appreciate Michigan from that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, other than being my home state. So <laughs> regardless of any of that, though, um, you know, basically he came up with this uh, this mandate for a racial task force work group, right? Right. That would ultimately come together, break up into different committees to basically say these are uh, ultimately what our recommendations are, hopefully um, tangible items, right, that can be applied immediately and or over time to the social equity program here in Michigan so that we can accomplish the goals I think everyone is setting out to accomplish. There were a lot of conversations leading up to that point just about doing the right thing and, and making the program become what it was supposed to become. Sure. And then it shifted to, okay, now there's a task force of 30 to 40 people. I can't remember the number. Um, uh, of folks that are primarily, you know, I would say 75 to 80 percent of them were within the cannabis industry, maybe mm -hmm. a few of them outside of the industry, but dealt with programming for minorities specifically in whatever lane that they existed in. Right. Uh, and then you took all of these minds in different aspects of the cannabis industry and basically, you know, from from uh, 
localities, to operators, to ancillary businesses, to elected officials, just across mm -hmm. the board. And then basically said, you know, finance, and then basically said, okay, now what can we can we propose, right, for the MRA to go after? Got you, got you. And I, I just want to interject and say, you know, <clears throat> props. We've talked about this before, but props to Michigan and specifically, you know, um, Director Brisbo for having not just the talk and and the words and talking a big game like we've seen so many politicians do on cannabis from every side of the aisle, but you know, actually putting some weight behind it and putting together a group with all those folks from all those different industries. I mean that. Is, is a great feather in the hat of the MRA and the state of Michigan that, you know, you guys have actually moved beyond talking about it and sort of at least started to be about it. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the verdict is still out, right? Sure. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it needs to be implemented. But to your point, it's a very good first step uh, in that process. So, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Now I did. Now on the other hand, so you were talking about some of the uh, statistics. I do have the um, the documents up here. So according to the December twenty twenty data, it's uh, three point eight uh, percent black owned and one point five percent Hispanic or Latino owned. And these are people. These are uh, ownership of licenses in Michigan's adult use market. So we can see that while you know they deserve to be applauded for the efforts. There's a reason that they have to make these efforts, right? Because the situation is is so bad. So we're we're in this place now. We've we've got the work group together. Um, can you talk a little bit more about you know these specific recommendations and like you guys kind of came to settle on this specific group of of what's in here? Yeah. So, so there were, you know, and it's listed in the report, but you know, you had the business development, you had uh, right. partnerships, you had, there were a couple of more, I'm, I'm working from memory at this point, right? <laughs> at these different committees. Um, we, we basically started meeting over the course of seven or eight months, we were actually working in these committees. Um, mm. and, and I would say on average, each committee brought maybe five or six um, ideas to the table. And so, you know, maybe 30 ideas in total. And then I think the report ultimately shows uh, 16 of them, right? Gotcha. Um, in priority, by the way, right? So after mm -hmm. we settled on um, the ones that the group would by, by and large um, back, if you will, right? Kind of by committee. Follow up to that was, okay, now which of these 15 or 16 end up being priority? Right. right. And, and and, you know, everybody voted on, you know, in, in a very democratic way on what sure, the priority sure. would ultimately be. And, and, and I think the way that you can expect to see some of these roll out. So so there was an all call for a, um, a work group, a new work group in Michigan mm. that would basically exist under the umbrella permanently for the MRA that would essentially be. The, the gatekeeper, if you will, um, from a social equity perspective on anything that's happening so far as any rule, right? Um, being ran past the group, but also helping with the implementation of these 16 um, recommendations, gotcha. which are in a draft form right now, right? In other words, like you, you understand the spirit of what should happen, right. but the nuances of those things still need to be explored, right? So the one that got the headlines the most <laughs> um, were the taxes. Uh, so there was like an excise tax slash be transfer between licensing tax mm -hmm. that was, was getting the most attention. Um, yeah, I see those are at the very bottom too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you had like newspapers – and organizations, I think, wanting clickbait because that's the thing that's going to sure. get everybody riled up. But it's number 16 on the priority list. It probably <laughs> had like the least amount of support, generally speaking. Now, I understand the, the, the context of like having to create income some way right. for the program, um, but there's better ways than, than taxes, in my opinion. And it, I mean, obviously, I'm an operator, so... Yeah. Sure, sure. I'm the one that's paying the tax out to me. It's, <laughs> look, I'm doing okay as an operator. Our group is, right? Um, 
what about the the one off mom and pop shop right that only has right. a store um, in a saturated Detroit market? You, you know, what are you taking from them to give to somebody else? Right. Like those right. things are still things that have to be considered. But regardless of any of that, um, we ended up flushing out 16 of them. The way that I anticipate that it's going to probably roll out, whether or not it has to go to the legislator or if it can be done by way of policy mandate from inside of the MRA, right? Gotcha. So those are the gotcha. things you have to take into consideration along with where they fall on the priority list as to how quickly, you know, we see some of them in 2021 versus what comes down the line in 2023. Gotcha. A couple that, that stuck out to me, um, corporate spend plans seemed pretty important to you know put together plans with a lot of these big companies that we've seen have been dominating the industry not just in in michigan but frankly worldwide um and so i think that's important uh integration with local economic development which is which is really um an important kind of thing to do um you know that is they're talking about integrating commercial marijuana with local economic and land uh land bank agencies so, you know, just I, I won't read through all of these, but, you know, you can get a sense of they're really trying to make uh, the Michigan cannabis industry a legit, more of a legitimate industry than, than it has been, you know, and give it some of the, the traditional uh, boosts and, and kind of uh, su support from the government that other industries have seen. Um, so now kind of transitioning to that a little bit, just getting back to the thread that you were just on, Chris, what do you see? I mean, we, we've had this report, you know, it's been out for about 10 days. We talked about the clickbaity kind of focus of it, but like, you know, where do you see things going from here? Yeah. So again, a lot of it has to, to do with the balance between, um, what's legislatively focused, right. Versus what can be done by way of policy without legislative vote. Um, and also, you know, where they fall on the priority list. And so finding that balance between what happens sooner rather than later. Right. right. Um, one of the ones that I, I would assume can be done in 2021, just for an example, would be the event permits. Right. Where yeah. um, you basically um, have event uh, licensees that have to have insurance for the entirety of the event. But the vendors that are at the event right would have to insure their own product versus the event licensee having to do the insurance overall right gotcha. um that's one of the ones that will probably be done sooner rather than later because it's an easier fix or a simpler fix from within the organization the gotcha. mr right gotcha um some of the other ones um that that stand out um, that might take a little bit longer, but we're higher in the priority list is the marijuana, uh, the Michigan marijuana market, the MMM, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if, you know, shameless plug, if you watch the <laughs> Cannabis Midwest podcast, um, there was an episode with Simone uh, Kaysong on there that mm -hmm. um, where she is kind of like the, the, um, the brainchild, the creator behind this MMM, this, this, this stock market for social equity applicants that would allow everyday people that have a certain amount of income, right, or revenue that they make per year, or income mm -hmm. per year, uh, to be able to participate as non-accredited investors into this market that would ultimately go to social equity applicants, right, or businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really interesting concept because I don't know that it's been done, especially for the cannabis industry before. Yeah. And if it can get done the right way, um, I anticipate that other states will probably follow suit. For sure. That no, and, and that, that one jumped out to me too. So just to, to uh provide a concise summary. So the Michigan marijuana market, and I'm reading from the report here, is a crowdfunding platform housed and supported on the marijuana regulatory agency's website. It serves as a portal for local investors and local marijuana businesses located in disproportionately impacted communities to gather and invest. Um, and then it goes further. The Michigan Uniform Securities Act provides a regulatory framework for the operation of an interstate market. So that is, yeah, that, that is really cool. You know, I think just based on everything that we've been talking about today and in previous episodes and, and you know, the broader uh, vision of Cannavision is, you know, getting opening up the industry and creating a, a level playing field. And we've seen that one of the tools, probably the biggest tool to doing that is money.
And yep. this allows us to, or it seems like it allows the state of Michigan to open up the money a little bit and, and have people come in that aren't necessarily from the same old groups that, that everyone is used to. So it doesn't, it doesn't get the like uh, sexy headlines, but, but it, it could do great segue into something else I, I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, we've, we talked about how cannabis equity is a problem throughout the whole country, really the whole world. Um, but, and, and, and so these recommendations are specific to Michigan. What parts of this do you see Michigan really utilizing to kind of lead the way in the industry? Yeah. So I, I you know, ironically enough, I should say I was just uh, elected as secretary for NCIA, right? So just basically. Nice, nice. My no responsibilities. Um, <laughs> But, but part of the scope for federal legalization, right, is going to be whether or not the Democrats are interested in these next two years before the midterm with hit, hitting a home run, as it's described, or uh, getting on base and hitting a couple singles to ultimately right. score a run, right, uh, for a sports analogy. The way that I, I think people in, in – in, some of the circles I've been in and in some of the lobbying folks that I've talked to in D.C. Um, are, are, are seeing it. I, I think the prediction is that they'll probably try to work with the other side more so than trying to shove uh, a bunch down people's throat with regards to cannabis specifically. Mm -hmm. um, because assuming that the midterms work that the way that they they traditionally work, the Democrats won't be in, in complete power for right. two years, right? So th there seems to be this conversation potentially around a more act 2.0, um, which would potentially handle the descheduling piece. Um, look, they they'll never replace 280E without finding a way to apply an excise tax or something like that to make up for that revenue, right? First right. and foremost. However, um, you know, a descheduling mechanism that would punt to the states to basically allow for opportunity expungement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, if indeed that ends up being the case, uh, it's, gonna, it's going to be important for states like Michigan, like California in particular, right, that, that seem at least to be pro-social equity, um, to set examples as to how it can be done, uh, especially for states like New Jersey, in New York, right, that are coming online here in the near future. Uh, New York as an epicenter that is going to be important that they set a certain tone um, for the rest of the cannabis industry. Uh, and so mm -hmm. to, to, to answer your question directly, you know, when you when you have potential funding mechanisms like the MMM that we were just talking about, um, you know, we borrowed in Michigan from Illinois the credentialing process where there's a certification that needs to be involved with having a license and having people uh, um, have certain credentials that work at the store. Um, right. You know, and whatever that, and really that does a couple of things though, right? It level sets the market in a way where if everyone has the same certifications, if everyone has the same credentials, then there's a certain amount of money that can be commanded at each location, at each store. Right. And what that does is, it, you know, it allows an individual, instead of making $13 an hour, per, for an example, whereas the store down the street is paying $16, $17, or $18 an hour, it gives you the opportunity to say, this position may be worth this amount of money um, right. related to the credentials that I have versus what they have down the street. So you either pay me the same amount of money or I'm going to go elsewhere. Right. And, and it really forces corporations to do right by the people that work for them ultimately. Right. So that's one of the other things that's, that's being implemented into Michigan the way it is in Illinois, uh, but from a Michigan's lens. Right. So right. there 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 are those types of things that are going to be really important, especially if the federal government decides to say, hey, the state uh, ultimately has to decide what they're going to do so far as opportunity. Um, I agree. And I think one of the reasons that efforts like these are so important is that I think the election of Joe Biden and the thin, very thin margins that the Democrats have in the Senate and the House are going to lead them to say, all right, you guys want to do this? 
yeah, I'll figure it out. And they're just going to leave it completely to the states. You know, they'll they'll take it off their uh, f- the schedule and so that it'll be completely federally illegal. But then I don't think we're I, I think the point of getting some of the more progressive measures that we saw in the early versions of the Moore Act is pretty much out the window at this point. So, you know, especially with, like you said, in, in midterms, the party in power tends to get smoked. So they know that they're, they're on a limited clock. The, the scoreboard is running down right now, so to speak. So, yeah, they're going to try to try to do what they can. So to me, I think that leads to a situation where as an industry, we've really got to be on the backs of groups like you guys and, and states like like a Michigan, like a Illinois, like a California that have led the way in equity and really learn from that knowledge and use that as a foundation to build upon. But unfortunately, as we've seen in some places like New Jersey, they don't always do that stuff. So so <laughs> I, I think that like stuff like this is is wonderful and amazing and needs to continue being done. And I think we just have to make sure that this kind of state level work is amplified because to me, this is really where the, the new battleground is now. Well, and well, in, in one more point that I'll add in, in some of the things that get overlooked that may not have cannabis or marijuana on the title uh, in particular, like the clean slate bills that just came out in Michigan, right. That would allow it. It, it encompasses people who have misdemeanor, nonviolent marijuana related offenses to get those expunged or, or wiped clean, quote unquote, right? The clean slate bills. Um, it got headlines, but it wasn't specific to the cannabis industry, although people within the industry can benefit from right. it, all, right? And so with bills like that, which was, you know, bipartisan legislatively passed in Michigan, um, and you mix that with specific um, social equity, cannabis, deliberate programs, I, I think we eventually get to a place where there are enough changes being made that um, that percentage that we were talking about in ownership, right, starts to shift slowly but surely over the course of the next couple of years, which um, is, is, a, is a big goal of mine, right, because I understand how politics are at play in a lot of these situations, um, but how can we continue to move the needle forward? And I'm not saying, listen, for the, for the folks who are activists out there, they should absolutely be demanding it, right, um, yesterday. You know what I mean? Um, but with the way that we know things actually tend to, to flush out, you know, are we making incremental growth? Um, right. And as long as, you know, the MRA, and, and I, know, I don't know if you're familiar, I don't know the name of the organization, um, or the association, but the MRA uh, is a part of a larger um, group agency now. There's a an organization where different agencies from different states are, are building yes, their own. Yes, yes, I know what you're talking about. Association, yep. right? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And, and the hope is that you know social equity is one of their pillars, right, or one of the blocks of the association, so that you know their voice carries louder when it sure. comes to guidelines for other states that are eventually going to be coming up. Yeah, I mean, 1.5% and 3.8%, there's a lot of room to go from there. And that's, you know, that's Michigan specifically. But like we said, the, the nation ain't much better. And most, most other states ain't much better. So um, cool, man. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for uh, joining today and uh, talking about your, your inside info. Um, we, we really appreciate it. Uh, we've been talking about trying to get going with some more uh, interesting hosts and, and having some guests on. So hopefully we'll be able to get that going for the next episode. But, uh, you know, I was really interested in learning more about this. I think it's an important topic for the industry. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad we got to cover this on the policy report. So thank you, man. Yeah, and no, I appreciate you for showing Michigan some love, man. Like I said, the Midwest gets overlooked. Um you know, traditionally when it comes to the cannabis market, but um, it seems like the state is doing a lot to help lead the way uh, in a lot of different facets. So happy to be here. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to the next episode where we can uh, dive a little bit into uh, some of the nuances of some of the states that are coming online and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Stick with us the rest of this year, 2021 in cannabis. You said it before, man. It's heating up, so it's gonna be it's gonna be a good one. So uh, stay tuned to the Cannavision Policy Report. Check us out on uh, Cannavision Instagram and socials, and uh, stay tuned. We'll catch y'all soon.